Hey everyone, it's Christy, and it's time to talk about GOP politics, and I'm here with my very special guest, Will Fox of the channel Fox Cousins. And I saw his videos on politics in the last couple of weeks, and I got really, really excited and happy because there aren't actually that many people <laughs> on YouTube who are making the kinds of videos that we're making. And I guess, you know, as an academic and a, and a political pundit, I don't find other people's views like threatening or wrong. I think we're all just dealing with the same data and we're trying to make predictions. And so hearing other people's perspective and their slant on things and how they view it, I think is really fantastic. And, it, and so I asked Will if he would be willing to do this on-air talk, and maybe this is something we can make a regular feature, because we've got a whole year mm -hmm. until the yeah, presidential absolutely. elections. Um, right, so Will, welcome so much to the channel. And everybody, after the Google Hangout, you, I will put links to his channel in the description box below. So if you're liking the videos I'm doing in politics, you should definitely check him out. So why don't you tell us a little bit about you, Will? Well, I like what you said because it's true. There are people who have opinions, and I'm one of those people. I love having opinions on the issues and on the people running. But it's also really important to know that sometimes it's fun to just take off the, the opinions hat and just to go ahead and analyze a race for the sake of the horse race. And that some people would say that's a horrible thing to do, but I don't, I love it. Uh, and that's one of the reasons I started my YouTube channel with my cousin uh, who I lived with when I was at university. And the two of us used to talk politics all the time. And it was a really pleasant conversation because he was very conservative and I was very liberal. And when I moved away, I started to miss that a lot. So we started the Fox Cousins political channel so that we could talk about the elections, we could share ideas and opinions. And what we've tried to do is create uh, an open space for dialogues like the one that Christy and I are about to have about, sure, some of the nitty gritty of the issues, but also just enjoying the, the specter of American politics. Great. Thanks so much for coming on. And yeah, it worked out well with the timing because we're in the same time zone that we yeah. didn't realize until very recently. So um, yeah, tell me a little bit about your how you got interested in politics and what your political positions are and kind of how you guys used to talk about politics. And sure. you mentioned it growing up. So well, I have this distinct memory of the 2000 election <clears throat> because I was it was the first election I was really honed in on. Um, I was what? 10, 15 at the time, I don't know. But the point is that there was a point in time where my mom came in and I was watching one of the major networks as they were chatting about politics. And she said, Will, go outside. Like, there's, it's nice outside, there's sun. You don't need to be inside listening to these people talk in circles about politics. And, and, and it just never stopped. Um, I used to be cable news obsessed. Um, when I moved abroad, I started becoming a little bit more interested in internet news and... And it's, it's just has never gone away. Uh, my cousin and I, uh, when I was at university, we, he actually lived with me for a few months on the couch. <laughs> and and when during that time was actually one of the most fun times of my university career because I'd just come out, sit on the couch, and we'd, I don't know, watch Fox News and yell at the commentators or, or just sit and talk for hours uh, in circles about, about really important topics. Great. And what's your political perspective? Where would oh, you yeah. Uh, well, I'm, I'm definitely on the, on the left end of the spectrum. I guess you call me a pragmatic progressive. Um, my most important issues are healthcare. I feel very passionately that a single payer healthcare system or some form of a universal healthcare system is vital for the country. I'm big on voting rights. I'm big on immigration policy and labor issues. And, and those are the things that really define my politics and what I really listen for when I hear candidates talking. So uh, as far as maybe to give you something more substantial there, uh, as far as the primaries go, I'm, I'm leaning towards voting for Bernie Sanders. I'm, I've made videos talking about him and his issues, uh, but I'm also willing to support Hillary once she becomes the nominee, because I think things like the Supreme Court are incredibly vital to our democracy going forward. So uh, I'm a pragmatic liberal. Right, got it. So just a little bit about in terms of mine, like I've always been, I think, a, a Democrat. I remember watching, and this is going to date me, uh, Reagan debate Jimmy Carter. I was still a little kid, really little kid. And I really didn't like Ronald Reagan. Pre and Carter was president at the time. Yeah. And while they were debating, I was probably eight years <clears throat> old or something. And I turned around, uh, I was sort of like sat on the 
of the carpet, you know, watching television in front of the TV, and I right. wagged my butt. I kind of went on all fours and I wagged my butt at President at, at Ronald Reagan <laughs> when he came on the air. And my mom sent me to bed for being really disrespectful to one of the candidates. Yeah. And so that's one of my earlier political memories. And then that's I do awesome. remember <laughs> like, the next time politics stands out was I called my mom and to ask for permission to get out of school that day because I wanted to go down to Madison, Wisconsin for a march to get the U.S. out of Central America. All right. <laughs> That's how I wanted to skip school. I wanted to go on a protest. And uh, she, to her credit, let me. And I went down to the protest with some friends and watched people get arrested for civil disobedience for the first time. That's and then, great. yeah, I got involved. Well, I mean, getting arrested is... I mean, it, it can't be great if it's for a good cause, but... <laughs> yes, but it was a part of that sort of just seeing what, um, how politics can be practiced and what people yeah. can do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then I was big into women's rights, obviously contraception issues, healthcare mm -hmm. as well. So yes, I've always been on the left side of the spectrum. And in full disclosure, I decided like a year ago that I wanted to support Hillary Clinton. Yeah, um, I, I, I heard that, yeah. <laughs> but similarly, if Sanders is our nominee, I'll get behind our nominee, because any Democrat's better than a Republican, so I will just vociferously defend whoever our party nominates. Mm -hmm. so that's I, think, uh, I think that the Democratic nomination process is exactly how it should be right now, <clears throat> because to Senator Sanders' credit, and, to, and so far to Hillary's credit, as far as I know, the both of them haven't gotten down in the mud to attack each other personally, and it's really been a debate of ideas, and that makes me respect both of them a lot more. I know Hillary's super PAC has gone after Bernie a couple times on a personal level, but on an individual basis, both of them seem to be taking part in a real dialogue, which honestly is not happening on the other side of the spectrum. The guys we're going to be talking about tonight, uh, the idea that uh, the Republicans would sit down and have a reasonable discussion like the Democrats did on Friday about things like health care and guns is an absolute joke. And, uh, and so I think that our side of the spectrum can be proud of, of the real, I don't want to say highbrow, but the, the, the policy discussions that are going on. Substantive. Substantive, yeah. exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I would concur with that. I hope that both candidates keep their disagreements focused on the issues and less about the side issues. So I would hope that that is also how the party goes, keeps mm -hmm. going forward. But yeah. since you brought up the other side. Yeah, those um, guys. Yeah, do you want to give me sort of your perspective on, uh, I, I, well, first before we go through the candidates, because what we're going to do in this is kind of go through the candidates one by one, but mm -hmm. do you want to give me some of your perspective on 2016 as a race for the GOP? Just some of your thoughts on... Sure. Um, on. So in the past decade, really since, uh, well, since the dawn of the decade and the last census, we've seen Republicans dominating places like the House of Representatives through gerrymandering in a partisan way. Uh, if you're not familiar with what gerrymandering is, I know you are, Christy, but for anyone watching, gerrymandering is when congressional districts are drawn to, to basically put certain voter groups together to benefit a certain political party. Republicans have been doing that on a massive level for the House of Representatives and state legislatures. The, state, the, the Senate now is under the control of the Republicans. And one place that's really been a holdout, a strong Democratic holdout, has been the White House under the leadership of President Obama. And one thing that we can now see going from 2008 through 2012 and now into 2016 is that the battle for the White House continually looks more and more like a place where the Democrats only have, well, the, the, it's the place the Democrats have to lose. The Republicans don't have the math, right? The math in each individual uh, battleground state doesn't work very well for the Republicans in places like Florida and places like Ohio new voter groups are becoming a bigger part of the electorate. And so going into this 2016 race, what the Republicans needed to do was to bring in a new breed of candidates that, was go that were going to elevate the dialogue on issues like immigration, on issues like women's health, things that were really important to voters in those swing states. And so far they, have, they are failing catastrophically. And so that was what they needed to do going into 2016. And I'm pretty sure through our discussion here, Christy and I are gonna, are gonna see that they been living up to that to that need and that expectation. Yeah, I just want to echo those comments because you see that the Democrats do do better when the whole state numbers have to be counted, not parceled out into little congressional districts. So we have held the Democrats, you know, just lost the Senate in an off year election, but the Republicans are defending way more seats in a presidential year in 2016. So they're on the defensive. And yeah, when you have um, a national election again, like president, where every single state vote counts, Obama, the Democrats have just been getting the popular vote. What is it, five of the last six? So yeah, I just wanted to kind of echo that, that um, part of the reason of 
the Congress looks so different from the rest of the government is that gerrymandering. And that's done um, not only just at the congressional level, but at the state legislative level as well, so that it's hard to get people who are gerrymandered into their legislative districts out so that when the next census comes up. But I think by 2018, we're going to be looking at a very sort of big demographic questions and questions about gerrymandering as we get into the 2020, because once we get the 2020 census, and they're going to have to draw the lines again, yeah. where, that's where the fight's going to happen. What state are you from, Christy? Wisconsin. Wisconsin. Okay, interesting. Awesome. I'm from I'm from Texas, and so that's what you just mentioned there with 2018 and 2020 going forward into the new new demographics. Texas uh, is going to be one of those places where the demographics would suggest that Texas would move into being a purple state, which I find really interesting. How did Wisconsin vote in 2012? Do you know? Um, we've always gone for Obama, but then in the off year, we've elected, I don't say we because I can't vote for the governor. I can vote for U.S. federal elections, but not the state right. elections. But they voted for him for governor, well, I guess three times now, but I don't think that's going to happen again. So it's the state of Tammy Baldwin, who is the first openly lesbian member of Congress or Senate elected. And maybe, you know, I don't know the House, but definitely to the Senate. And then Ron Johnston. But mm -hmm. Ron Johnston is going to be going up against Russ Feingold in 2016. So I think Russ is going to win again because obviously the numbers are on his side. So it, it tends to, it, Wisconsin goes a lot on who turns out, mm -hmm. which isn't really saying a lot. It's kind of, if you know politics, you know that that's how every election goes. But it's really a um, good year for, it's good in presidential years and not that great in all presidential years. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, I mean, as you know, it's just a, a trend among Democratic uh, success and failures as well as, I mean, not only do you have the general historical trends of off years for presidents being bad year or, you know, two years after a president is elected, his party does bad in the midterms, but it's even worse and exaggerated for Democrats because mm -hmm. they have bad turnouts in general during those midterms. And so, we, yeah, it snowballs a little bit. And that's how we get Mitch McConnell as the majority leader in the Senate. Yes, precisely. All <laughs> right. So let's get on to, should we start um, with Carson or Trump? Oh, um, I would like to talk about Carson first, if that's all right. Go for it. Okay. Um, I think that Carson, and I, you, I think you already know this about me, I find that Carson's exposure right now in the media and his general rise as relatively irrelevant. And what I mean by that is that we know that the winner of Iowa is almost, at least in the recent elections, never the nominee for the party. We can see that with Mike Huckabee. We can see that with Centorum. And so I would suggest, and I saw in one of your videos, you were talking about how uh, Carson may start to flounder. And you might be right. But I would suggest that even if Carson stays right where he is and wins Iowa, that it bears no consequence on the 2016 race. I think that, yeah, um, I don't want to disagree with that, really. I think that that's a very uh, accurate assessment because you don't see him picking up numbers in the states that follow Iowa. You don't see him moving in Nevada. You don't see him moving in Florida. You don't see him. I mean, he's in second place in New Hampshire, but it's farther behind Trump than he is, you know, anywhere um, than in, in Iowa where the race is much closer with Trump. And one of the things you're going to hear me talk about tonight and, and one of my favorite things to do is to pick the brains of real Tea Party conservatives and, and to figure out what, what they're thinking on on these sorts of things are. And I've talked to a few about Ben Carson. And one of the things that I find in general with the with the 2016 race so far is that a lot of them are going based only on headlines. So they'll say things like, I really like Carson, and they won't have a reason why. And I think the reason that that happens is that these folks are, are, are not actually paying as much attention as maybe Christy and I are to this race yet. And, and, to, and to accent that a little bit, Ben Carson is someone who doesn't necessarily make that many headlines. He is now, because he's under more scrutiny, but up until this point, I would call it a deafening silence of Carson. Not only does that come across in his demeanor and his just general sleepiness, I guess you would put it, uh, but even in debates, you know, he would, he would shy away into the shadows. And so that meant that, that the only thing that people were hearing about Carson were the very small tidbits about, oh, a black guy who's a brain surgeon, who's not a politician. Well, that sounds good. Uh, and so, it, yeah, no, now that he's under that scrutiny, he might, he might come back down. Yeah, I think there was some data out of Iowa that showed 80% of his supporters would still consider voting for somebody else. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that the other thing that seems to resonate about Carson with his supporters is that he's likable and trustworthy, which is mm -hmm. kind of nice, but it's not necessarily the criteria on which general elections are won 
in terms of you know, people would rather I think have a strong leader than somebody that, that was nice and soft. But the one thing I do want to say that it's not that I disagree in any right. way, but with Carson's impact in Iowa, I don't think it's entirely irrelevant because mm -hmm. he is then therefore sucking up a lot of the support that Huckabee or Jindal or mm -hmm. Cruz or Rubio might pick up a little bit in terms of you know, right, making, uh, getting a head start on some kind of momentum coming out of Iowa. So him sucking up those voters, I think, is weakening um, other other candidates, including some perhaps guys who have a, a longer term, at least viability, like Cruz. He's got a long term financial plan. So in that way, he's he's interacting with other candidates. <laughs> You're right. And I saw a, a headline today from Rick Santorum, and he said, "When I'm on the campaign trail, a lot of people tell me, wow." I didn't know you were running. And, <laughs> and it's so true. And it's yeah. because, number one, he's not on the main debate stage. And number two, it's because people like Carson, like you said, are sucking up that, that, uh, that energy and that attention from the media. Mm -hmm. So his, my, his biggest role is probably just a spoiler role, mm -hmm. really. Do you think that there's another state that Carson could win in the first four? So between Iowa, New Hampshire, South Carolina, and Nevada? No, I mean, even looking, I looked at the numbers for a video recently, and there were, I think the Nevada numbers were October, but it's just not the same dynamics in mm -hmm. Nevada that there is in Iowa. You would have to probably go to some place like a Kentucky or someplace where you get, you know, high religiosity in mm -hmm. the South for him to, basically, you need another Iowa, you know, yeah. an Iowa that's farther South, I think, for him to have those kind of numbers. So that's why I, you know, I'm glad we have this channel because I think people who watch it are going to be better informed when the media comes out and goes, in a new poll, this happened. And I hope mm -hmm. our viewers would go, well, yeah, but what's the real clear politics average? <laughs> there you go. I love real clear politics. And actually, I was looking just today at the real clear politics averages from the last cycle. And what's really interesting is that the last, also four years ago, in this time exactly, was when Herman Cain was peaking. And it wasn't long after that he came crashing back down amid scandal. Mm -hmm. Admittedly, there were sex scandals, much more poignant than grain in pyramids like Ben Carson's talking about. But nonetheless, uh, when somebody comes up on top, the media and even his opposition, just they all pile on. And this, and this is the kind of the result that happens. So yeah, Ben Carson's peaking way too early to win Iowa. Yeah, agreed. And he is not a professional candidate in terms of knowing how to handle himself in a press conference and how to handle questions and answer things in a way that he won't have to go back and restate his position and change True. his position three times over the course mm -hmm. of the, you know, it just gets the story legs if you it have does. to keep going back because he keeps changing his answers. I will say that he is right in that I, um, I saw a press conference from with him and he was saying, well, the more the media attacks me, the more my supporters are going to love me. He's not wrong, but it's those people that gave him the surge, the people that weren't supporting him before the surge that will, will eventually leave him again. The ones you mentioned there where 80% weren't sure that they were going to support him def decidedly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, have you, uh, did you know that he's out on his book tour right now? He's not actually running for president. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Any thoughts uh, on that tactic? I, I you know, I guess he thinks he already knows he's going to lose and he's just trying to squeak out every penny he can. I have no idea. Um, it's a little bit embarrassing, but then again, uh, he wants that national exposure as well while he's writing Hyde. And I guess going on a book tour expands your, your media presence in other places. That's the only logical excuse, uh, excuse that I can come up. But, you know, I'm not in the business of excusing Ben Carson for anything. So yeah, Fair enough, fair enough. <laughs> what about uh, the rap ad? Do you want to... And react to oh, his. man. <laughs> I thought it was a joke. I thought it was the onion, honestly, when I saw it, because I, I think I first found it on Twitter and you never, I never trust anything I see on Twitter. Uh, but then I clicked on it and then I Googled it to make sure that I wasn't like getting trolled or something. No, it really was a rap ad. And I honestly, um, my real question, the one that will probably never be answered is did Ben Carson sign off on that? Or is it true that what he's saying now is that I had no idea. It's just like Chris Christie and the bridge scandal, right? His staff did it. I, I was not involved in producing a rap video. Right. But isn't that supposed to be him at the end going, I'm Ben Carson and I approve this message? It's kind of yeah. hard to say that you didn't approve it when it's got your voice on it saying yeah. you approved it. It's pretty bad, I will admit. But amid, amid like his lying about West Point and the, the pyramid thing that he's been talking about, and, and what Sanders also said today, Bernie Sanders said, you know, we – who cares about whether he's been lying about his in his book? You know, look at his atrocious policies. Uh, look at his abhorrent tax plan. I mean, 
beyond the scandals and the tabloidy things, this guy is not on any level or solid ground uh, policy wise. But that's my opinion seeping out, not my analyst. So sorry about that. <laughs> no, that's fine. As long as you declare what's what, I think yeah, it's that's fine. That's my bias, everyone. Hello. <laughs> Yeah, I saw it. And, you know, I think if you're going to do something like a rap video for a candidate, it has to come spontaneously from somebody who supports you. You know, you can't be as a campaign out going out there and hiring someone to write a, a cool rap song to do to engage in African-American outreach. It just everything about it just was so obviously uh, I guess Kyle. What's the guy's name? Who does secular uh Ah, uh, Kyle Kalinsky. Yeah, Kalinsky. It's a, his last name I can remember. He just said, you know, next he's going to get um, put on lipstick and a skirt and high heels and go sit next to women going, oh, <laughs> I know just what if my back is aching. And oh, because uh -huh. it's that kind of pandering. It's just so obviously like, oh, you know, um, yeah, I carry, I worry about uh, things not being pink enough too. It's just the worst sort of way to it assume is. you're going to get votes. And you're so right. I didn't even think about that. That's a great point as well. I mean, Obama in 2008 is an example. The, the, the grassroots YouTube movement of songs and things, yeah, they were super cheesy. And even the Hillary Clinton country song, I don't know if you've seen that one. No, I didn't oh, see that one. Cringeworthy. But you're right. I'm, at the end, it's somebody else trying to, in an artistic way, support a candidate. And you can't manufacture that at all. Uh, and the weird thing is, you know, Carson probably could get someone to do that for him who's not connected to the campaign. I mean, Christians love those sorts of cheesy videos. I've seen uh, Baby Got Bible on YouTube <laughs> the, uh, instead of Baby Got Back. I've seen the Christian side hug. I don't know if you've seen that one. It's another rap song. So Christians, I mean, they do this stuff all the time. It shouldn't be that hard. You shouldn't have to even pay those expensive campaign advisors for such terrible advice and advertising. Yes, I completely agree. If you Have you guys seen, or have you seen the two um, African-American women who really like Donald Trump? And they do. Not, no. Oh, this is—they are great. You have to see them. Um, <laughs> so it's two women. They're really enthusiastic. They're Trump supporters, and they make yeah. videos on YouTube. And that's just kind of what they—you know—they're that's their way of sort of supporting their candidate. Right. And uh, one usually talks, and the other one kind of backs her friend up a little bit. So uh -huh. it becomes sort of like this. You know, you gotta do this, and her friend goes, uh huh. And so it's like it's great because watching their interactions, the timing, and you're just really caught up in it. And you know, if he put those women on a video. That would be huge. I mean, if he just sort of actually got their permission to use their YouTube channel where everyone could yeah. go see it and stuck them on a video, that would look way more authentic than mm. anything Ben Carson tried to do in that rap. True. I'm actually surprised, uh, and since you mentioned you know, Donald Trump's grassroots, well, I don't know if you want to call it grassroots, or just general level of support on the internet, it, I think it rivals that of Bernie Sanders a little bit. I mean, we saw Ron Paul in 2008 and 2012 really gain a following on the internet and a dedicated fan base. We're seeing that with Sanders now, and I'm finding only because now I'm, I'm actively posting on places like YouTube and Twitter that there are a lot of Trump supporters on the internet. If I criticize Jeb Bush, no one cares. If I criticize Marco Rubio, nobody like retweets me angrily or something. But if I you know, just make a, a, a half-hearted criticism of Trump, I'll have you know, a bunch of PMs and comments. It's, it's incredible. Yeah, it's, I think it, you're right. The intensity there, they might be small, but it's a, there's an intensity to mm -hmm. his, his support. And since we've now nicely segued from Carson oh, to Trump, I'm really getting good at this YouTube. Thing. Yeah, you are. That was excellent. <laughs> <laughs> so the Donalds, do you want to go first and give us your thoughts on Mr. I Trump? do. I want to challenge you a little bit on this, Christy, because I, I saw your video, your, your 30 minute, I think it was a 30 minute Real Clear Politics analysis. And you said something about how Trump doesn't need to win Iowa and that yes. he could w come in second and then maybe still win the nomination. You could be right, but you're wrong. And here's why. Uh, <laughs> so it's, it's totally possible, but I feel like Donald Trump is not a good loser in the slightest. And what I mean by that is even just drip, dripping down to like second in the polls in Iowa and still being on top nationally is not good enough for him. He called Ben Carson today like a pathological he said Ben Carson had a pathological disease, um, which I know he's, he's prone to hyperbole, uh, but I feel like he's not, he would not take losing Iowa well enough to recover and move on to, to New Hampshire. And at that point, when people like us are not only people like us are paying attention, but really the electorate is actually honed in, uh, that that will not go over well. And I feel like that, that kind of momentum uh, for Trump specifically, is that's my only exception. I feel like Trump actually does need to win Iowa in order to go on. That's just right. my, I, it's not, there's no data to back that up. There's just my general feeling of him being an incredibly sore loser at times. 
I definitely would agree with that. And I think when he first got his, his poll numbers went down for the first time and there was that very potentially damaging Montes, um, corn seed uh, yeah. with Monta Mons Monsanto oh, yeah, yeah. comment. And I went, wow, that's, if he's going to start going after voters, that's going to be the end of his campaign. And he quickly retracted, blamed mm -hmm. it on somebody else. <laughs> uh, the only time I've ever actually sort of seen any sort of apology come out, true apology came out of the Trump campaign was when that uh, insulting to voters thing came up. Mm -hmm. So I guess my, my reason why I don't think Iowa is, is as important. I mean, yeah, I agree. Donald wants to win everywhere, yeah. but if he is, if he is still dominating Bush in New Hampshire and he can point to South Carolina and he's 20 points ahead in South Carolina, and then he can look forward to Nevada where he's ahead in Florida. I think the narrative can be, look, I love Iowa. And I, if I, you know, I, so I'm happy for all the support I get, but you guys don't pick winners anymore. Mm -hmm. So if he, they pick him, you know, so he's got a bit of a way to diffuse that. And also mm -hmm. I think he's becoming a better candidate. And I think he's becoming a, the evidence for that, that I would give is in the last debate, he didn't screw himself as bad as he did in the first two. <laughs> That's true. But I mean, in those first two debates, his poll numbers did nothing but go up. It's crazy. No, 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 no. If you look at the real career politics. Right. If you look at the real code politics average, he has two drops, and those are usually oh, okay. right. Those are right after the debates. Oh, okay. um, I didn't know that. Okay. Yeah. So if you go by the timing, if you like an events analysis. I was um, so surprised when I uh, just to see him into the race. I was surprised. Then to see him rising, I was surprised. Then to see him on top, I just <laughs> my my girlfriend can tell you, I just was laughing. Like I would I would turn on the television and I would just start laughing. Uh, like I remember his his uh, not to go too off topic, but he had a, no, there was a preview for the for the second debate where he they showed a clip of him at a at a rally in Dallas, Texas. Oh, so embarrassing. That's where I'm from. Uh, but he said they're gonna attack me. Whatever, whatever. And just the comedic timing of that, and just the ridiculousness of Donald Trump. Sometimes I think we just need to sit back and just look and say, wow, there are 15 people running, and Donald Trump is on top. <laughs> What is happening? What is this? <laughs> it does feel like bizarre world. Like what is like? I can't believe this is our reality. I think um, for me, when I for, when he first ran and he paid people to show up, I was definitely not taking when he and seriously when yeah. he went uh, down the escalator. The Stair Force One, I think <laughs> John Stewart called it, just ridiculous. And he was yeah. such a ridiculous man. And um, and then after he made the outrageous racist comments about uh, Mexicans in Mexico, mm -hmm. I thought that that for sure that was going to be the end. And then I, once he outlived that, I was like, wow, that's quite different. And then the McCain yeah. thing happened. And then I started to see that it took a while because you expect a base to react in certain ways based on how they've reacted in the past. Mm -hmm. And what I think the media didn't pick up on because they were so busy maybe talking to themselves mm -hmm. was that in the, the voting base, they didn't care that he was insulting yeah. people. And they didn't mind that he was saying these outrageous things. And, you know, I had also done election research in the UK in the last election for the 2015 mm -hmm. British election. Oh, we should do a hangout about that sometime. Okay. Oh, All right. Continue. Definitely. <laughs> and we had people who supported UKIP. Yeah. Who we're saying about Nigel Farage, he doesn't talk like a normal politician. You just don't feel like he's going to get a lot of spin. And Nigel Farage, you know, he's always got a, like a cigar or a cigarette, I should say, I think a cigarette and a pint yeah. of beer. So they're like, oh, you know, <laughs> you, my, they would associate being Nig Nigel Farage with a pint and a fag, you know, just yeah. being down the pub jolly guy that you can have a laugh with. Uh, George and, W. Bush, very, very George W. Bushy. <laughs> yes, yes. And I was like, wow, Donald Trump is the Nigel Farage of the, the GOP. But yeah. in this a hyper conservative base that exists, he occupies a place that 20 years ago, he wouldn't get enough traction, you know, but now mm -hmm. I think like Sanders, there's a core of about, well, he probably has a smaller core in terms of the spectrum, I think, yeah. where he's got 20% to 25%, whereas I think Sanders is more like 30 plus percent, <laughs> maybe 40% of mm -hmm. the Democratic base. And um, yeah, his ability to he, I just see him now like a linebacker who mm -hmm. is plowing through the down the, the iron grid, mm -hmm. knocking out everything almost that comes in his way. He's back up in Iowa. I don't know if you saw, but the last yeah. most recent poll on Friday put him up again. And it's like, can't touch him. You can't. can't touch one, thing I, one thing I will say, uh, based on what you just said there, was uh, uh, the UKIP people, the, the hate that you were experiencing in the comments section a few weeks ago, was what I got when I, I just mildly explained the UK elections in a video. And I was, I, I apparently, according to the UK people, was an Anglophobe. 
That being a person who is afraid, has a deep-seated fear of the English, which I can assure you, I do not. Uh, I love the English. Most of my friends in Spain were actually from, from London. Anyway, uh, you mentioned earlier about, uh, about uh, Trump and, and his like persistent support and how the media just didn't seem to get it right. And I'm really glad that I'm not a paid member of the media at this point because I would have said after the John McCain comments from Donald Trump about, I don't like heroes who get captured. I want my heroes to be not captured. That was the moment in my head where I said, that's done. You go after Mexicans, the conservatives leap that up. You go after veterans. And if the conservatives don't get you, the veterans groups will. And that just didn't come into fruition. And that is when he really defied those expectations. Mm -hmm. And so afterwards, after that happened, I started really kind of soul searching and figuring out, you know, what am I getting wrong in my own mind? And what is the media obviously getting wrong as well about Donald Trump? And I think to, to understand his persistency, it's actually not that hard. You just have to see the world from the conservative AM talk radio bubble. And what they see is that a bunch of young people and minorities elected a black guy in 2008 who went on a two-year tirade with health care and cap and trade. Then they, the Republicans elected a, a Republican majority in 2010. And, they, and that was under the promise of government shutdowns and of, of that sort of Tea Party change that they all wanted. And they did it again in 2014 uh, when they, they said, we're going to repeal Obamacare. And the Republicans gave them the Senate to top it off. And after all that... If you're a conservative, you're looking right now and you're saying the government wasn't shut down, the, the debt ceiling was raised, uh, we have the executive action on immigration, we have R Obama in the conservative's mind just running rumshot over the Constitution and, the, con and the, the Republicans to a conservative are doing nothing about it. And so when you see that, you can see how the Republicans, when they hear things like Donald Trump isn't ideologically pure, they say, I don't care. They say he's not an experienced politician. They say, it doesn't matter to me. There is nothing that he can do wrong because all I care about is not voting for another empty suit, promising, like empty promise Republican candidate for president of the United States. If you look at it like that, it's not that complicated to understand why Trump is doing so well and for so long. Yeah, I mean, I think I want to just add on to that and expand it by saying that, well, you know, because I got was trained as a political beha behavioralist, and I, yeah. I look at the cross tabs of the surveys that come out. Mm -hmm. And the way that I, I guess, having re read into the numbers, what I see in the GOP to contrast it with, with the Democratic Party mm -hmm. is the Democratic Party had, can be diverse and give voices, I don't think it gives enough voice to the marginalized in, in all honesty, but we do better than the other party in terms of lifting people up and also descriptive and substantive representation of people from their own communities rather than spokespeople that are talking. Mm -hmm. So, but we have, um, yeah, it's, it's a party that has a lot of different elements to it, but we all have a lot of the same common goals or values. Whereas I think within the GOP, it's, inc you know, the, the evangelical base was taken for granted for a very long time. And then there's a, the sort of a fiscally conservative base too that was interested in increasing uh, tax breaks and you know stopping the welfare. And within the GOP now, I think it is a good way to think about it is Trump voters and Carson voters and establishment voters. And because it's not, they don't, they're not as cohesive, I don't think, as the Democratic Party is. Mm -hmm. You have evangelicals who have very specific policy goals that aren't necessarily worried. They're not the same policy goals as the establishment people. Mm -hmm. And those aren't the same as the anti, they're the more sort of xenophobic um, people who are in the Tea part, the sort of the Trump supporters. And so whenever, when we talk about later candidates, one of the things that I always look at in terms of how viable a candidate is, like a Marco Rubio, is who is he going to get his votes from? Yeah. And because the establishment pie, the, the establishment size of the pie, I think is only about 30% of the entire pie. And they're acting like they still can get the whole pie. So that's, yeah. I, I think looking at the voters and those, the, what the, you're right, the, what the electorate, the ele this election is not about the candidate so much as it's mm -hmm. about the electorate and what separates 2016 and 2012 in my mind. And then I'll let you speak. Um, of course. Yeah, just uh, I, this last thing out um, is that they have the candidates, they have options. 
this time that they didn't have in 2012. And the electorate, as you said, is more alienated from the establishment than ever before. And the party is tearing itself apart in the House, and the candidates are ripping themselves away from the RNC when it comes to debates. And inside the party, they can't coalesce around a candidate. So it just seems like we're watching the disintegration of a party from within because they're unwilling to find common ground and unify around issues that they should have in common. I agree with you. On that last point, however, on the point of the establishment kind of being on the down and out, at this point, it does look that way. And you could be right that this could be the ahistorical year that really just changes everything. And in many ways, it is with the the sheer number of candidates and the kind of candidates that are rising to the top of the polls. However, I think it's really important to remember who we're talking about here. And who we're talking about here is the Republicans, who always talk big always run to the conservatives when it's fun. It's like, you know, flirting with the, with, the, with the cute guy when you're on vacation and no one's looking, but they always come back to that establishment hubby at home who's working a nine to five job. And, and I think that that, that that translates to, we can't count out the establishment in any way, shape or form yet, whether it be Rubio, Bush, Kasich, maybe Christie. I know he's kind of a little bit less of an establishment guy, but one of these governors and senators shouldn't be written off just yet, because they elected John McCain as the nominee in 2008. They did it with Romney in 2012. And, and there's, just, there's just too much historical precedent, precedent to say that the, the Republicans won't come running back as the, as the price, primary process draws on and as electability becomes a more important uh, question. Yeah, I think if you had a moderate who actually makes it now, I don't want to say what happens. I mean, the convention, I don't think there's any way the establishment's going to let Donald Trump be the nominee. Um, I don't know how they're going to yeah. stop him, but that is their problem. Um, but yeah, once the general election comes around, whether the people are alienated enough to not turn out for that candidate versus, you know, um, being motivated to keep a Democrat out, that they would be willing to go and vote for Jeb if he's the person who's who's got the ticket. Mm-hmm. But I, I just think that for, for these voters in particular, the Carson people who are attracted to him for religious reasons, and also the Trump people who are really having their id like s- stimulated all the time when it comes to him saying the things that they want to be able to say and offend people, and he's saying it. After you've had haagen can you really go back to ice milk? <laughs> After you've had Trump, if you had four months of highs with Donald, can you really go back to Jeb? I think the only way that's possible is if the Republicans come to their senses and realize that, you know what, haagen is delicious, but haagen isn't someone I can live the rest of, isn't a food that I can eat every single day. In the end, I'm going to have to go back to my fruits and veggies, and in the end, we're going to want to beat Hillary Clinton, so we're going to need a more diversified diet. I think I'm losing the analogy now, but the point is that, that, that I, but I, you could be right, and it could be that they say, you know what, this haagen is just too delicious. I'm going to go buy another pint. Or they could be too lazy to go to the corner store and go digging in the fridge for a salad. I, we'll see what happens. Yeah, I want to say, I think, you know, Joe Scarborough is exactly where you are. That's what he hopes the GOP base was going to end up, which is some, somebody sensible at the end of the day. Yeah. But this was also the, he was also the same guy going, look at all our senators, look at our governors, and who's in the top two? Neither a senator nor a governor, so. Yeah, it's insane. Um, and I, I know we'll get, I'll save my, my, my you know, my, per, um, my prognostic for people like Bush and the establishment guys for when we get to them. Yeah. Uh, but I think, I think we're pretty much on the, on the same page when it comes to this establishment versus the insurgents guys. It, it's possible. It's absolutely possible. <laughs> and right now it is. There's no reason to think that something is going to fall out of the sky and save them, you know, so. It is. I will say that the polls in general right now and polls <clears throat> this early in the primary process, it is still early. I mean, we are, what, within 100 days or so of Iowa, but the well, point is that... 90, I think, now. I think it's three months. First of February. Mm, it's so soon. Uh, but and at the same token, this was in the 2012 cycle. This was before the rise of Newt Gingrich. This was at the peak of Herman Cain, like we said earlier. He crashed. Gingrich peaked. Gingrich pa- uh, crashed. Santorum peaked. And then finally, after all of that, Mitt Romney, all the way into, I think it was uh, March, wasn't until he was uh, actually on top of the national polls again. So, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pick you up on that because I actually okay. did a video on this. And I looked at it. If you look at the numbers, and this is why we disagree a little bit, but Romney was always either number one or number two. Right. And he would basically be number one and people would go, I don't want Romney, Rick Perry. And then, oops, 
And then, okay, back to Romney and like, oh, Herman Cain, 999. And then he flamed out and like, okay, Romney. And then it just sort of happened again and again and again until finally he outspent all of his rivals. And I don't see that same dynamic. I don't see the kind of, um, we've had a summer of this already yeah. and we're getting onto Thanksgiving. So True. who is the big, all we've seen is establishment people go down. Mm -hmm. So I think, I, I think you, uh, it's interesting you say that. And I, I wouldn't disagree except just to say that the sheer number of people makes that sort of storyline almost impossible at this point. So going, you know, okay, if not Gingrich, then Romney, if not Herman Cain, then all right, Romney again. Um, you're right, no one even comes close to where Romney was in the polls, even at his very, you know, humble second place. But the, the, the sheer number of candidates makes a narrative like that harder to, to see if it were going to happen this cycle. And I think that really, like January, after New Year's, is when we're going to get to see the field either start to fall apart and a coalesce around their establishment, or you'll see people like me starting to apologize to Christy about how wrong we were and, and saying, all right, well, it looks like it really is going to be Trump. Uh, and, and I think that uh, one last thing, and then I, we can probably move on to another candidate, yeah. uh, but I just think that this, this election is so ahistorical in some ways that if someone, if Christy is right, then we might see this race going on, not just past New Hampshire and South Carolina and Nevada where things are relevant, we might see Super Tuesday become super relevant again. Uh huh. Super, super. And then, I mean, what I would love to see as a political junkie is a fight at the actual convention. How cool oh, yeah. would that be? Oh, wow. Uh, I would have to take vacation time off work. Yeah. It's like the World Cup, you know, people in other countries, they, <laughs> like, they take off days for, you know, when Spain plays Germany. But I, I would take off for the debates. I would take off for the convention just to watch that on live stream. That would be oh, amazing. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, you know, I would also be on like we could have a chat on um, like live screen uh, to talk about what's happening on at the yeah. convention because I would also be at home watching that on the internet. Yeah. And um, any other, I guess I think you know now the there's a if, if you know British politics, there's a, a reporter who asked a prime minister or something like, do you do you see any problems coming up um, between now and the election? He's like, well, events, dear boy, events. You never know what's going to happen. You never know what's going to drop or what's going to get released to the media or. Yeah. David Something. Cameron is so incredibly British sometimes with his, you never know, dear boy. And then what do you say that one time about Scott Walker? He said, like, I, when I read that, I spit out my porridge. <laughs> oh, <laughs> really, dude? Really? <laughs> you spit out your porridge? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so um, I think, yeah, we, who knows what's going to happen. But I think just Ceteris Paribus, uh, Donald Trump has always maintained control over his message. He's always contained control over his momentum. He's now finally starting to have to spend money for the first time after being at the top of the polls for 100 days. So I just think in terms of all the other candidates that I can see on the table, establishment or not, you just ask me who is best positioned to actually run all the, run the table. He's the only one I see with who ticks all the boxes, who can do everything right now. So then we can, can, yeah, can I ask a Can I ask a favor then? Can we talk about Cruz next? Because I would say, yeah. maybe you would agree with me, that Cruz is the other guy who has the potential, just like Trump, to carry it all the way through. Oh, I don't know if I could get him to carry it all the way through. I could see him rising in Iowa and maybe like a South Carolina, um, not so much in Florida because Jeb and Rubio are there. But yeah, Ted Cruz, I think, is, is Carson's biggest threat, not Trump's. Mm. Okay, so now we're going to get some real disagreement here because I see Cruz as someone who doesn't have the New Hampshire firewall that maybe we were talking about earlier, where if a Carson wins Iowa, he ain't going to win New Hampshire. It's a firewall there. Huckabee, Santorum, they win Iowa, New Hampshire, shut it down. Cruz is someone who has so much money and such impressive organization and rhetorical skills. A rhetor I hate the guy, but he's really good at what he does, that I see him as someone who could, who could keep going and who, uh, back when I was actually living in Texas, he had a, a really vicious Senate race with Greg Abbott and all the horrible things that could have come out about Ted Cruz came out and nothing stuck. He's really, really slimy. Uh, and he's like a running back that just can't be tackled. And so I see that, that, that maybe Florida firewall, New South Carolina, the question becomes with Cruz, where is the last stand for the establishment? Um, and then to your second point that he's the biggest threat to Carson, I honestly see Cruz as a bigger threat to Trump. And to go back to the people who were we were talking about earlier, who maybe aren't as honed in as we are in this, they're going based only on headlines alone. Um, I think that Cruz and Trump appeal to a certain, a, a big, a bigger chunk of the same people than Cruz and Carson do. And
And people will be leaving Trump maybe for Cruz, not because they don't like Trump, but because they'll just, it'll be another, it'll be a flavor of the month. It'll be his time to peak and they'll, and they'll kind of move over. Um, now, I, I think that our two opinions will be tested in the polls as if Carson starts to fall and Cruz goes up, well, then we'll know, we'll know that you were right. Um, but if, if Trump finally does start to crack a little bit and, and anyone would be a fool to predict that uh, and Cru Cruz goes up, then, then maybe we'll see that, that my prediction or my dynamic uh, is, more, is more full of the truth. And I have to, I mean, my idea on Cruz comes from not me being brilliant, but because I was reading the cross tabs on, I think it was Gallup data that I was looking at. And uh -huh. when you go deeper into the cross tabs, you see that Carson gets a lot of people with high school support and uh, high school, I'm sorry, high school education and attended church uh, at least once a week. Mm -hmm. And Cruz really didn't do very well with any demographics except for people who had a high school diploma and also going religiously once a week. So he, that's why I, I think there's a mapping on. Trump does well with, with Republicans who don't attend church at least once a week. So there is sort of like a less religious part of the Tea Party that is you know, sort of xenophobic and, and problematic in that way, but they're not the kind of same people who are supporting Court Carson, who I think are more the softer evangelicals who um, are turned off a bit by his shoutiness. And one of the things that surprised me about Trump was that he was winning women and men more than any other candidate, because generally, if you look, maybe like this particular conservative selection sample of women were not representative, but generally women, if you put men and women in a room together and have them watch two people debate and the two people really tear into each other, the guys are like, yeah, it's like a verbal boxing match, get him, get him. And the women are like, I, didn't, I don't want to hear you shout at each other. I want to hear you discuss, you know, things in, in a normal tone of voice. Mm -hmm. So I think with Cruz, Carson fading or his credibility or his trustworthiness falling, he would be the natural place for a lot of those evangelical people to land because he's um, doing, he did very well apparently recently in Iowa, a little speech he gave, he got some positive stuff. And I, I think he can do that evangelical bit because his father being is a preacher better than Marco Rubio. So that's why I think the demographics. I like up. your theory. That's really interesting. And I, uh, and I'll go ahead and just concede. I think you, you make an interesting and, and, and pretty solid argument there. So <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll, I'll let you have it's that. Just the data. Theory, huh? Yeah, yeah, it's just the data, yeah. so it wasn't, yes. I'll and admit we'll that I didn't go digging into, like, which candidates' supporters are subscribed to, to Time Magazine or, like, yeah, you know, really which happening. one of them, like, uh, which one of them, like, Rocky Road ice cream more than the vanilla. So, hey, you got me beat on that department. Yeah, that's okay. <laughs> Usually I'm going to go, like, yeah, well, you know, my PhD in political behavior means that I know, <laughs> like, so, but that doesn't, <laughs> doesn't mean I'm going to be right. It just means I can tell you how I look at data, and then you can look at it, other people can look at it the same way and come to mm -hmm. their conclusion. So, uh, yeah, Cruzy Cruz. I think we both think that he's well positioned, and I think you're exactly right about his machinery and his money. He's mm -hmm. doing the money game better than any other candidate out there because he is planning for the long term in a way that I don't see anybody else doing. No. And to further that, Cruz has one thing that another guy had in the last cycle but wasn't able to capitalize enough on, and that was Newt Gingrich, who. Mm -hmm had a big moment against John King in a CNN debate in 2012 when he attacked the media to a standing ovation from the crowd. And Cruz did something that I feel echoed that in the last debate when he attacked the moderators. And that to Republicans is such red meat, as I said in one of my videos. And the difference between a Cruz and a Gingrich is that a Cruz has much more money than Gingrich ever had in his campaign. And Gingrich had money problems, sex scandals, things that really brought him down. And, and Cruz doesn't have that to the same extent. Um, but now I'm just talking in circles. So No, 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 that's fine. I know I think there's a really good point to make. So I didn't want to cut you off and it wasn't superfluous at all. So I think it's a good comparison in terms of how a, an establishment figure can be an insider in, in versus an outsider. You know, Newt Gingrich is much more like on the Jeb Bush sort of, I can get things done from the inside. But what is Cruz's appeal is that he's trying to play that I'm an yeah I'm elected but I'm still an outsider oh, yeah. and he does that better I think than Chris Christie than Bobby Jindal than anybody <clears throat> else out there oh yeah and since I know we're not going to spend too much time on Jindal let me just say that I'm yeah. incredibly amazed every time I hear Jindal how he can be both simultaneously incredibly angry and passionate and also get me to tune out whatever he says it's amazing how do you do that how do you come out so aggressive like he does push all the right buttons I think Jindal really is the dumbed down, like not so talented Ted Cruz. They, they kind of had the same strategy of like, I don't talk about me, I just attack President Obama. But J Bobby Jindal somehow comes off both angry and monotone. And I, 
it defies all logic. <laughs> Do you know uh, CinemaSins mm -mm. on YouTube? Oh, well, you have oh to go CinemaSins, everything yes. that's wrong with, yeah. Right. Well, now I'm, whenever I see Bobby Jindal, I'm like, discount Ted Cruz. <laughs> <laughs> Is that what they said? <laughs> no, but and now I'm going to hear that oh. in my head because you said he was like a cheap version of yeah. Ted Cruz. But now in my head, I'm going to hear discount Ted Cruz with the sin. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's so true. I, I feel I don't, I don't know what to feel about Bobby Jindal sometimes because I hear him and I'm like, it's a, he's just he's saying it. He's saying exactly what you know Republicans should be hearing. And they would and if he were better at it everyone would be nodding along in that audience who are Republicans. But when he's on talk radio or when he's doing interviews, you can just hear that the interviewer is like, about to fall asleep. <laughs> Magic. They should, they should prescribe him instead of Ambien. So I think, I would, could, would it be fair to say that we would both sort of put Ted Cruz as like number, well, tied for fourth or third place with Marco Rubio with a bullet? We think he has potential yeah. to go places. Yeah, I think he's got a rise coming, and not just like a Marco Rubio media predicted rise, but a real one. And I, I would agree that, yeah, he's, he's somewhere there, like you said, because of his money and because of his just retail skills as a politician. Little finger. Mm-hmm. So, from Game of Thrones. Right, so should we go then, because if we're going to do it in order of, you know, uh, polling – performance Marco Rubio would be probably next he would be um and I as you probably heard in one of my videos I'm really critical of the media's portrayal of Rubio and and that's because before this third debate I feel like they were really priming him up to hit it out of the park they did it with Fiorina they primed her up and then boom she hit it out of the park and she rose and soared in the polls and Rubio prior to that debate I mean there was a little bit of a bump and no one could deny that he had gone up one or two points, but we're talking about margin of error kind of mm. things under 10%. But to his credit, he knocked it out of the park. And now he's seeing what one could consider a real rise. And what I will say as far as Rubio's actual chances going forward, his viability is that the rules that don't apply to Donald Trump apply to Marco Rubio. So when Trump doesn't have experience, when Trump says something crazy, Nobody cares. But for Rubio, the things that the, dim, that the Republican base have as opinions that he doesn't agree with or that he's maybe pushed as policy in the past, we will come back to haunt him. The immigration bill, the mm -hmm. comprehensive immigration bill will absolutely come back to haunt Marco Rubio in the past. And his national, national security, uh, I'm sorry, yeah, his, his foreign policy as well will be an issue because one of the things that he knocked it out of the park on was on foreign policy. But to Jeb Bush's credit, he said that Marco Rubio was kind of like a Republican Obama. I think it was Jeb Bush. Yeah. And it's true. Yeah. Marco Rubio doesn't have any foreign policy experience. Maybe he's been on some sort of a Senate committee, but I think that will come up to haunt him as well. That he's, if his big thing is foreign policy and being young and new, those two things don't mesh together very well. Yeah, I think, well, one of the, well, Joe Scarborough said something that also sticks with me now is that whenever I hear Marco Rubio speak, I'm wondering who's running, running for student government president. <laughs> and he doesn't I really, did that. <laughs> <laughs> I was president at university, but um, right. yay, college campus president, well, one year, yes, and by, when, I, mean, I can't be elected it, it again. It's important. When you do yes. it, you're like, yeah, I'm very important right now. I get to meet with administration and like the mayor and stuff. Go to boring meetings. Yes. Oh yeah. <laughs> Harley pro. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so with Marco, I guess I think he's as well in terms of his, like his presence. Okay. He's got the water thing. That's also visually going to haunt him, but hey, that's a perfect time. While you're explaining yeah. that, I'm going to run and get some water because like oh, Marco yeah. Rubio, I get dry mouth. I'll be right back. Yes. And whereas I came prepared because I've done hangouts before. So I'll just fill a little time and assume that you can hear me. Um, and if not, I'll just have to repeat myself. Uh, Marco Rubio. Right. So he's is pretty good in terms of his ability to speak well and give good policies. Can you still hear me? <coughs> I can. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. I, I just did a little filling while you were gone. Marco's problem that I see is less about his performances and more about the back of the house kind of stuff in that when I run in Politico, he's not fundraising as much. His fundraising numbers were not strong, at least not if he wants to become a national campaign. You know, Ted Cruz has got doing that sort of stealth campaign where he's not playing on a national stage. But if Marco Ruby wants to take over for Jeb, he's going to need to fill that. And he's not raising enough money right now to do that. 
-hmm. And also that he's not been hiring <coughs> staff, which normally wouldn't be such an issue, but as you pointed out with 15 candidates in the race, if you're still hiring staff in November, all the good people or you know the really great people or the connected people might already be having jobs. Mm -hmm. And so, not, let alone that he's competing with people like Jeb Bush for those staffers, both being yes. in Florida. Mm -hmm. Precisely. They were moving, moving from the same pool. So I think the question I have, so um, in terms of his debate bump, we have a phenomenon that we discuss in political science, which when we do a time series analysis, you have a, an observation at the same point in time over, let's say, 40 months. So it might be unemployment rate, the unemployment rate from month to month. Mm -hmm. And then you might have something bad happen, like the economic crash, and unemployment shoots up because of that one event. Right. And then over time, the economy starts to recover, so that unemployment rate comes down again. Oh. That's a similar thing to what happens to candidates in debates, and it's a debate effect where they get a lot of media coverage and they see a rise in the polls. That's also known as a convention effect. You know, after the Democrats have their convention, their candidates go up. After the Republicans have their can candidate, the candidate, their numbers go up. So in political science, what we use to control for this. It's called a lagged endogenous variable. And the logic of it is, if unemployment was 8% last month, my best prediction is that it's going to be 8% again this month. But if it's changing, it doesn't go from nothing to 8.9%. Let's say it goes from 8 to 8.9. You don't need to explain the 8% unemployment. You only need to explain that 9%, 0.9% change from one month to another. And so we can look at how long a debate effect happens for a candidate by seeing how long it takes for them to return to where they were before. Mm -hmm. And I pointed out in my last video that Carly Fiorina had a nice, had about a four point bump. From I was going to ask you about Fiorina, yeah. Yeah, and so what I'm going to be looking forward to see what happens with Rubio is can he use that debate effect? Because he had about a two point rise in the Real Clear Politics average afterwards, the, the most, I think it was yesterday when I looked. And if he can get that up to like another 2% and level that off, if he can go from it being a, a curve to a step shift, mm -hmm. then, then I'll know he's a real candidate. No, that's a but good if he point. just goes back down again, then he hasn't really capitalized on that momentum. I see him going back down, but that's just my gut feeling. And I've always felt that Marco Rubio would be a much stronger vice presidential candidate mm -hmm. than a presidential candidate. And I have a personal conspiracy theory that in 2012, Mitt Romney vetted and asked Rubio to be his vice president, and he said no so that he could run in this cycle. Um, I think the writing was on the wall for Romney, and, and Rubio would have never said yes. I don't have any evidence for that. Uh, but but Rubio, is he is vice presidential in the making. He would be perfect. A Spanish-speaking guy from a, a swing state. Yeah. Young, charismatic. All these all these experience issues would be no matter if he was running for it to be the vice president. But that's Trump, just not the Trump case. Trump Rubio 2016? Oh, God. I think... <laughs> oh. <laughs> it would be interesting to see what that would do for Trump with Hispanics. Because... You've got, I mean, not to, not to say that like all Hispanics are just going to follow whatever the young Cuban guy is saying, uh, but it would just be interesting to see if you've got someone who's openly and rhetorically just it doesn't care anything about the Hispanic vote. He'll call them rapists. He'll put the biggest journalist from the Hispanic media, Jorge Ramos, just kick him out mm -hmm. of the place just to show that he's the boss. Um, it would be interesting to see him pair up with someone like Marco Rubio. I, I don't know. <laughs> I think Ted Cruz would make a more natural pair, but I don't know if Ted Cruz could take a second pole position. I don't think so. Don't you think they would just like be too much together, though? I mean, they're pretty. I, I feel like Cruz and Rubio or Cruz and uh, Trump have like a similar have a similar style. Am I am I wrong there? No, I think you're very right. Yeah, I, I think Trump just does it better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cruz does it in a way that every word is obviously very, very pointed right at his target audience. He knows exactly who he's going for. And that's sometimes the case with Trump. Like you said with the id, he knows how to scratch the inside of someone's brain, but he's not always that way. Sometimes he'll just, he'll say whatever he wants. It just depends yeah. on his mood. <laughs> it's completely crazy, yeah. So I think I would actually, I mean, I'm gonna wait and see what Marco does, but I don't have, a, I wouldn't put a lot of weight into Marco until I see him actually do the kinds of things that he needs to do to become president. And then I'll be looking at his, his fourth quarter fundraising at the end of the year and also his, um, how he's do, doing in terms of his field operations and is he going to the places where he needs to go. Because the question that could be asked about Rubio is where does he need to win? Mm -hmm. He can't win Iowa. New Hampshire is getting pretty crowded, but if he doesn't win New Hampshire, 
then you're going into what South Carolina. You can't wait till Florida if you're Marco Rubio. So you where be, does you can't he be Rudy Giuliani? You can't be Rudy Giuliani. No, and wait no, no, <laughs> no. Yeah. I think you're telling you hit the nail on the head. And the question for Rubio right now is, oh, so on, on a rhetorical level, can he withstand the the attacks that are going to be coming on the issues I mentioned earlier on immigration, on foreign policy? And to your point, whether or not. That, that he ends up surviving those attacks that are coming. What he needs to be doing right now is capitalizing on momentum. He needs to be doing the fundraising that you mentioned. He needs to be setting up the organization because there's no guarantee he's going to be where he is today, even in a month. It could be that he crashes down like Fiorina did, even lower than when she started. Yeah, the Fox News debate's on Tuesday. So, you know, who, who knows what's going to happen then? Mm-hmm. Um, I think that the, the debate on Tuesday... What makes me the most curious is what are the numbers going to be? Obviously, they're going to set records in the Fox Business Network, but that isn't a default channel that everyone gets. Fox News is, CNBC is for basic cable. Fox Business is not, unless I'm mistaken. And so I'll be curious to see what what the viewership is and if that viewership affects the kind of bumps in the polls and who won, who lost kind of movement that we see after the first few debates. Yeah, and you know, with um, with these kinds of events they're not easily accessible like um you know a a channel like cnn that means that more people will be dependent on the media coverage of the event rather than watching it themselves so they're going to be only seeing as much of the debate as the media decides to cover Mm -hmm. so the media effect of that might be bigger than the other defects just because people won't have had the chance to tune in directly that's true on cnn they did a good job of letting you watch no matter where you were and let's not be – they weren't doing it out of the kindness of their hearts. They wanted people to download their app. But on a practical level, if you just ignore that profit motive for a second, you say the issues were important to the American people, and they gave it to everyone for free. As long as you had the internet or a, a tablet, you could watch. That was good. And I will say with the CNBC, it was the exact opposite. I, I listened to that debate on the, on the radio uh, because there was like a New York radio station that carried it. Uh, and then uh, with, the, with this forum on MSNBC – I only could watch clips. I had no way of, of actually watching that unless, well, I don't know what the, what the other option would have been. But you're right. That made me more reliant on what the media told me, how, what happened at the forum. Did Bernie do, did, uh, did Bernie do well? Did Hillary do well? I didn't know. I, I don't know. I, I didn't see it for myself. Well, so remind me after true. we go off air to give you a link to maybe solve that problem for you. Awesome. I assume that you've got a cable subscription you've legally brought with you over here. Of course. That's definitely it. Okay, very good. (laughs) So um, are we done with uh, Rubio? That's all I had to say on on old Rubio. My girlfriend thinks he's attractive. So thanks, thanks, Rubio. You found a way to make me jealous, huh? What the heck? (laughs) Like going by the – you going to watch the debates tonight? Mark Rubio? I'm really – it's funny, my girlfriend My girlfriend is German, and, and uh, she's now really into this whole horse race as well, and she wants to know what's happening, and it's cute, because uh, especially with Trump, she's just so confused. She's so confused. Yes, <laughs> how could, are many how could people. that guy actually be on top? <laughs> well, when I was in the UK, it was for the, um, the year... It was, Obama was reelected, and I had set something up on the university campus uh, in our like government department, where we we had a digital uh, projector and and a screen. And people were streaming. We were streaming it, and people were watching the results come in. Yeah. And actually, the campus, a lot of the campus, there was a bar that stayed open all night to watch the American results come in. Awesome. And uh, yeah, I was actually I was dating somebody at the time who was uh, English, and. You know, English elections, you stay up to 10 o'clock at night to hear the polling results and then you go to bed because you're yeah. not going to get a result till the next morning anyway, or mm-hmm. at least not till 4 a.m. Yeah. But watching it happen in the U.S. where you get this territory and this state wins and this state goes for this person, the points are adding up and we're getting really close to the point and it's Iowa and Obama wins, you know, yeah. whatever. <laughs> and he was like, I've, that was the most exciting politics thing I've ever seen in my life. I and I'm like, that's the American election. Yeah, like it's the presidential so is. <laughs> It's really great. It's a fantastic spectacle. I actually enjoyed the last uh, British election, but it just doesn't compare. The reason I enjoyed the British election, not to get too off the 2016 here, but it was because the candidates actually all sat together of big parties and small, from the Labour to the Conservatives, all the way on the end of the Green and UKIP. They all had to sit there and talk to each other, and they got a little bit feisty at times, and that's just not something you often see in American politics with those third-party candidates actually – getting a voice. I thought that was really interesting. 
And another little aside to from my qualitative election study, we did focus yeah, yeah. groups on the nights of all the uh, debates. And I think it was like after we'd done the the poll election and we were at we were in Cardiff we asked the respondents I just decided to kind of like throw it out there like did you pick up on in any of the debates what you felt like was sexism or sexist remarks or people reacting to things and the everyone from that point on just went no it wasn't really no it didn't even come up I was like even wow Nigel that's Farage was relative I mean hmm, yeah you were exactly. a very reasonable debater if you just watched yeah. the debate you'd be like okay yeah why not <laughs> So yeah, you had three women on stage, but the fact that there were women on stage, other than like someone would go, in, you know, it really enhances my feminist aspirations. It wasn't that kind of an issue. It just showed the difference to me between British politics and American politics, which is for a country that has um, a lot to say about how proud they are of being American, they really hate each other. Yeah. <laughs> it's very true. Um, I love my conservative brethren, if nothing else, for the for the entertainment value. Of course, there's people like my cousin on my channel who's incredibly pleasant to talk to, intellectual, conservative, I would call him. Yeah. You get the crazies, but you know what? I still love them because they're entertaining, they're interesting, and we wouldn't get the spectacle you described without them. That's true. All right, so back on task. I think we are to number fifth place, Jeb. <laughs> oh, Jeb Bush. Can we have a nice chat about Jeb? We can. Um, I'll get started, and I'll say that... I'm going to bring up a little bit of history because I'm Fox Cousins. We do a little bit of history as well. And I went digging to find someone who fell flat and got back up. And the only person I could find was George McGovern Govern in 72. He went on to be nominated for the Democrats against Nixon. He was in single digits. So I found one guy, all right, one guy who, who made the comeback that Jeb Bush is now talking about. That's that, being know. Said, that being said, I'm with you and your analysis from the last video that the guy – He's more or less gone. And the media, both left and right, were 100% agreed on this. Rachel Maddow did a really good segment where she showed that redstate.com, the Young Turks, like everybody from, from both ideological ends of the spectrum, establishment media, independent media, all said, it's done. Jeb Bush is out. And I'm just going to I'm gonna jump in here and say, just I'm going to hold out and say there's still a little bit of chance. There's still, there was George McGovern in 72. There could be Jeb Bush in 2016. All right. Well, you're way more optimistic because I was going to ask you next. Can we place a wager? Can we get out before or after Christmas, New Year's, or New Hampshire? <laughs> Man. Well, well you, you go first. Where would you wager? And then I'll. <sighs> I guess I think he doesn't. I mean, if I was looking at it tactically, there's two things to consider. One is the humiliation of admitting that you can't sustain a national campaign and you have to get out before the first caucus date. I mean, only Walker has really done that so far, yeah. or Perry too. But I mean, Walker was the one who tumbled. Yeah. And he doesn't want to be another Walker, I don't think. Yeah. On the other hand, the amount of money and time and resources that are going to have to be spent just to try to keep him close to double digits between now and February is going to be a lot of money. So I don't know, I don't, I guess if he can't, his super PAC aside, if he can't keep up the farce of a national campaign by the end of the year and starting it in his fourth quarter reporting. Mm -hmm. <sighs> yeah, I think there's a possibility he could get out before Iowa, especially if he's not doing well in New Hampshire. I'll do a little bit less data intensive uh, response to that. I think he will be out. The reason is because of a, a quote I saw from Ted Cruz today, defending Jeb Bush. And what Cruz <laughs> said was, and if there's anything that, tells you that someone is not a threat is when you start defending your rivals, yeah? And Cruz was like, the media is telling Jeb Bush he should get out. No, I like Jeb Bush. He is he's bringing something to the table in the dialogue. And that, to me, says that Cruz looks at Jeb Bush and is like, ah, ha, ha, I think you're I, right. I don't, I don't, you don't threaten me at all. Um, so, yeah, I think he's going to be down and out. There's the, the only little tiny hope that, I, that I'm reserving, my McGovern-style hope here, yeah. is that his, his drop right now, because he's already so low in the polls, isn't that precipitous? He went from 7% to like 4.5 in the real code politics average or something. It's just sad. Um, if he goes below like three or two, he's gone. Uh, but that little sliver of hope is also there that it wasn't like he just lost all his support. He just lost about a third of the very small amount that he had. 
Yeah, I mean, if Rubio does a nice job on the Fox business and outshines him again, you could mm -hmm. see his poll numbers go that far down. It's just the sort of, you know, the blood in the water and the people just start abandoning the, the program because they can smell that he's not, you know, death <laughs> from a mile yeah. away. Yeah. And, uh, and I think that the, the, the space in New Hampshire for that guy who's hunkering down and who's going to be like John McCain and go around in a bus and talk to people and come back. It's not viable this time because of people like uh, John Kasich who are camped out there, Chris Christie who are camped out there. If people want to go for a reasonable candidate and, and, and jump on the guy who's really showing them that he cares, they've got a lot of people to choose from that aren't Jeb Bush and who don't carry the baggage that Jeb Bush carries. Uh, you hit it on the nose. Yeah, I, I completely agree. So uh, Jeb's dead. Jeb um, is gone. So you know that if, if we're wrong, they're going to come and they're going to take <laughs> out this section of the live stream and be like, "Look at that!" Yes. Liberal like, well, you were four percent in the polls. I mean, seriously, like yeah. you know, get some Viagra for that campaign. Otherwise, I think it's done. One more thing I'll, before we let Jeb Bush go. To yeah, your yeah. point is that he's just he's not interested in running for president. I feel like maybe deep down he's like, "I want it." Like my my daddy was president. My brother was president. It's my turn. And if you know the story of the Bushes, you know that Jeb was supposed to be the candidate for president long before Bush was, if Jeb Bush or uh, George W. was ever going to be the nominee. Uh, and he didn't get that. And, and, and so what I see from Jeb Bush right now is just a lack of energy, almost like a kid who's had his lollipop taken away. When he comes out and he's like, I eat a bowl of nails for breakfast. I'm a fighter. And he's like, start writing my comeback story. He doesn't use the kind of intonation that I just used. He sounds like Snoopy. Or, no, wait, what's that Mopey cartoon character, Mopey the dog or whatever from oh, Hanna-Barbera? Yeah, Droopy, Droopy the dog, <laughs> Droopy, isn't it? Droopy, that's it. Like, Droopy Poopy, Jeb Bush is like, he, he, his heart's not in it anymore. And I think that that is part of the reason the media and his donors are just so conclusively knowledgeable or, or they're so steadfast in that he's dead. He's dead. It's because he not only looks dead, but he sounds dead. I think I mentioned in one of my videos this idea that the Republicans are having their first 21st century campaign. And Jeb, Jeb Bush is a man who's still running a 20th century strategy. You know, he's saying recently, I guess in the debates, I'm going to have to answer differently than the questions I've been asked, as if this had never occurred to him before, if it, he hadn't seen it happen in multiple debates right in front of him. So, yeah, I just feel like he's ran out of time. It's, yes. Time has passed. And can I, can I do a little confessional here as a liberal is that I don't like Jeb Bush. I don't like George W. But the media is not wrong when they say that, yeah, they seem like just nice enough guys. So maybe you're in over their heads. Like, I feel like if Jeb Bush was around, I'd be like, you gave it your best shot, man. Give him a hug and just send him on his way. Because, I mean, someone like Ted Cruz is vitriolic. I, I can't stand it. Jeb Bush just seems like a guy who's got opinions vastly different than mine, who doesn't have the kind of passion that he needs to have. Yeah, not when you're compared to Donald Trump. Yeah. I mean, maybe if it was only Ben Carson. Mm -hmm. For sure. Uh, you mentioned Fiorina earlier. Can we go on Fiorina? Yeah, go ahead. No, no, no. I want you. I've been going first every. Oh, okay. Here. Uh, I think she's done. Yeah, I think she had her moment. She couldn't capitalize. She couldn't convert it. And the other thing that uh, has come to define Fiorina for people who don't like her is that she's a liar. And she hasn't changed her tune at all. She's still lying. She's getting into fights with people, with the women on The View. And he, she, so I think the only thing that she really had going for her was that she wasn't wearing trousers. She could wear a skirt on stage. I really I think that that, that I was... I heard that trousers. I heard that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so you can I tell I've I, I been I actually living. did that myself uh, with my mom and my sister, and they looked at me like I had lost my mind. Yeah, I was home over the summer. Like, where's the bin? She's like, why do you want to, why do you want the, like, the recycling bin? Like, no, the garbage bin. Like... <laughs> The garbage? You want to know where the garbage is? It's over in the sink. Where's the rubbish bin, man? <laughs> yes. Well, at least I'm not inadvertently putting German words. Oh, yeah. So where's the, where do I put the moon? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but um, oh, Carly, yeah, I think um, her only shtick was that she was the woman who was running in a sea of men. And that she could say really terrible things about Hillary Clinton that other men on the stage didn't have to say then because she would say them. But you're, that's a one-trick pony. Yeah. Um, and so she's... Yeah, I think she's filler. For me, she's like giant right there with Jindal and Huckabee and the other people, with Lindsay swimming at the bottom of uh, Yeah, the and I think that she made the same mistake that Hillary made when Hillary, you might disagree with me on this, but I thought it was kind of silly when Hillary was like, 
why would I be exceptional? Well, you should vote for me because I'd be the first woman president. And I, everybody is thinking that, and she is right. But I just don't think that's a good answer politically. On the same level, Fiorina, when she was like, you should vote for me because you know you want to see a woman debating Hillary Clinton, I thought, yeah, that's what we're all thinking. But you don't, like, you don't need to say it because we already know that. We already, we already know that's what, like, what would be happening. And everybody's already got that in their minds. Um, and so I would say that just this is probably gonna be the shortest section of our discussion here because I think Fiorina, like you said, down and out. Saw her rise, saw her collapse. The media gave her every opportunity to really to long haul it and to, to make it happen, and it didn't. So for that reason, and she's probably the most boring person to talk about. The only little caveat I'll give is that I still think that she could, in theory, be the vice presidential choice for the very yeah. reason that she's been talking about. And for anyone who says, well, she's a liar and she's got a bad business record, uh, you know, Mitt Romney also had a pretty mixed business record. And Republicans are pretty good about when they get, you know, the Democrats come in and say, oh, you laid people off or you, you know, your stocks crashed. They go, oh, you just hate the free market and they judo it around. So if Mitt Romney can do it, then Fiorina can do it as the vice president, but not as the actual nominee. No, I agree entirely. Okay. Uh, well, yeah, that's self-fulfilling prophecy. We had Fiorina, like when I was looking at her, I was like, what am I going to even say? Like, <laughs> yeah. It's not like her, her rise and fall were interesting in that moment. And I would be like, if we want to take a bet, I would, I think it's odds are like hundred to one that she even comes out of 4% back to six or seven. Like, yeah, she very, she I would hope that as the debates go on, the thresholds for participating will go up. You know, um, I don't know. I mean, the, the RNC, we can have a whole other show about how the RNC handled yeah. debates this time. Um, but yeah, I don't, I mean, her, her only chance to get noticed now is through the debates. I agree with you so. on, the, on that note, except for the idea that they should be raising the threshold. And the reason is because it's a tough question. When you have 15 people, a good number of them who are actually sitting office holders, who can you like? Why why should we be discluding people who are actually a governor, who actually are serious candidates for president, who maybe in scientific polls are aren't hitting a certain two percent mark? And then the reason I make that argument is that even the pollsters are saying that that like you shouldn't be politicizing our polls. That's not what they're for. That's not a scientific data driven way of debate participation. And I, I realize that at a certain level, when you got fifteen people, you're going to have to cut them off. I don't have an alternative, but I would say that. The thresholds probably, in my opinion, shouldn't be going up. That if, if somebody's getting, if, there's re if they're registering on on a two to three percent level, then they should be able to, to have their say. Well, I think okay. First, I want to say yes on the polls and all that other logic. Had had I advised the RNC, I mean, Reince Priebus is also. It's really um, depressing in some ways, like the way that politics in from Wisconsin is impacting the you know Congressman Ryan is now the House Speaker of the House. He's from Wisconsin. Scott Walker, who destroyed union rights and the middle class of Wisconsin, was you know on the presidential stage. Now you've got um, the Milwaukee debate is happening, and uh, what was it, what we were just talking about that had to do with Wisconsin, um, but. Uh -huh. Um, oh, Ryan's Priebus, stupid Ryan's oh, Priebus, yeah. Yeah. Uh, head of the RNC, he's from Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. And I would have told him, have it split, like Rachel Maddow said, have two debates on two nights, 90 minutes, make it completely fair, put a random, put, you know, candidates on the stage. Mm -hmm. But if they were going to go with the polling, then, I mean, I'm, I'm saying raising the threshold on the assumption that people will start to fall off a little bit. Um, and, it, yeah, I mean, the whole thing is a complete debacle, but... If you are down at 3%, if they're going to go based on the polls, then there's got to be a viability here. The, the, the idea of having these two-tiered debates is because they, the RNC must see their, you know, well, I guess you know, the stations are supposed to be doing it. But there are some candidates that are viable that you actually do need to hear from. And there are some candidates that you just don't. And now, again, back to the British election, when we were doing our focus groups, we had debates on the people with the people with the seven all every single party leader on there and then we had the ones with just the challenging parties and then we had the ones with the three parties that could possibly be in government together mm -hmm. and in the seven person debate people in the audience uh, that we had noticed that David Cameron was getting more questions than other candidates or Nick Clegg was getting more questions than, than other candidates 
not candidates, they were party leaders. Right. And they said, well, yeah, but, you know, the Green Party's not going to run Britain, so I don't mind that they give an extra 10 minutes to David Cameron, because it's actually really important that I know what his policies are, and it's nice that the Greens are up there, but actually, I'm more interested in hearing what he has to say on this issue. So I think there's also that, you know, by having so many people on stage, they all just get their little sound bites on or they have their little fights. You don't un unpack policy, which I think the RNC is going to see increasingly, I would hope, but maybe not because that's I, I don't always get as a problem because you're right, the contrast between the substantive debates that's happening on the Dem sides and then just blaming the media, entertainment, popcorn throwing that's happening on the GOP side doesn't really help the candidate who has to actually fight the Democratic nominee after the summer. In a perfect world, it would be viability and also just what are you saying that's substantive? You know, every every person we've talked about so far, their plan for health care is repeal Obamacare. Mm -hmm. And it's like, what what are you going to replace it with? What are you going to do? I mean, I, I'm a pretty big liberal. I think Obamacare didn't go nearly far enough. But at least the Democrats are talking about health care as a human right, as an economic issue, as how do we improve what is not the ideal system that we do have. Um, and the Republicans, all of them, uniform, repeal Obamacare. In a perfect world, it would never happen, and I would never be the person to usher this in, but in a perfect world, they'd be like, well, you don't even have a plan on health care. You can't be in the debate. Right. That's <laughs> uh, the dreams of a naive liberal, but, uh, you know. <laughs> yeah, and at least if you had fewer people on stage, you would have more time to have those back and forth and True. hopefully panic. But, but I think we're off topic. Uh, we were at Fiorina. Um, <laughs> what do you have I left on your list? I was going to suggest, I was going to throw out Rand Paul. Oh, poor Rand Paul. Um, <laughs> yes. I, I have nothing new to say about his chances, but I do have a general theory of Rand Paul that I'd like to share. Please. Um, and, and that theory is that Rand Paul, part of the explanation of why Rand Paul is doing so horrible and why his support's not there, and not, not just why he's low in the polls, but why there's no real energy behind his campaign, why he looks depressed when he talks about himself in interviews, is because he has been usurped by Bernie Sanders on the complete opposite end of the political spectrum. And hear me out here, they, they, they agree on lots of the things that the passionate supporters of Bernie Sanders agree on. Social issues, on drugs and marriage, they both basically want to have that at the state level. On NSA spying, they say no, no NSA spying program. On foreign policy, they're both relatively non-interventionists -inter and against the kind of military action that we're currently performing. And because of that, Bernie Sanders is just the new guy who happened to get all the all the attention from those people, those internet warriors, those people who drug legalization and, 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 and marriage equality and NSA spying, those are the important things for them. They just happen to go to, to Bernie Sanders. And I think part of that's because as a young person, it's easier to support a Democrat than a Republican among your peers. Now, nobody can misconstrue that to say that I don't think Bernie Sanders has a good leg to stand on. I'm supporting the guy. But I think that can explain part of the reason that Rand Paul is just doing so depressingly bad <laughs> well uh that's an interesting take i don't heard that before i go i don't think about Rand paul that often yeah. when, so when i have thought about him it's about him getting um you know working with the state legislature in uh or the party in kentucky so that he could be on the ballot in both places yeah yeah my theory of Rand paul is he thought that when he walked onto the stage he had his dad's army of followers behind him Mm -hmm. And so he just went forward and didn't realize for a really long time to look up behind him to check. Yeah. And when he did, he was by himself. He basically, yeah. You're so right. That is a great analogy. It's like West Side Story. You know, the gang walks up, they're snapping. <laughs> and then at some point, Rand Paul is just snapping alone. He's like, where'd the echo go? Why? <gasps> That's, that's, then, the, that's a great way to put it. Yeah, and now he's, he's pissy because he doesn't get the crowds that he expected and it's hard work and people aren't giving him money and it's not fun. And I think there was a lot of sense of entitlement mm -hmm. that he was the heir apparent in many ways. And then I guess, you know, I think actually the way I would say it is that in, 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 the, in a perfect, like in, in an alternate GOP world, mm -hmm. Rand Paul would be playing the role Ted Cruz is playing right now. Mm-hmm at 10% and 11% and kind of making a break in Iowa. And that's, I think, perhaps where his alienation comes from a little bit, is that I think, you know, that the place for the libertarians has been sucked up by Trump in some way, sucked up, um, you know, and, and some of the other candidates. And yeah, and now he's he's not the candidate he thought he would be. I'll be very curious to see if he runs again in 2020. Mm -hmm. 
um, because assuming that Hillary Clinton has won the, the presidency, that's a big assumption, but assuming she does. And so in that case, there would be no Elizabeth Warren running in 2020 to suck up those those young, energized people on the social issues and spying and the banks, uh, then Rand Paul might be able to give it another shot. And I, I've always thought that he had a legitimate chance. And the reason that I thought that originally was because people like my cousin, the kind of intellectual conservatives, if we want to call them that, that really do think about these things and for whom the issues really do matter and the debate really does have an impact on how they vote, Rand Paul fills that niche. And, and, and can be at certain times very thoughtful on the issues. Not always, but sometimes. Um, so I think there is a, a niche for him, perhaps. I hope. Or, like you said earlier, the, the party is just completely imploding and there is no room left for the intellectuals of the party, of the, cons the, you know, the intellectual conservatives who just by principle are opposed to government and being involved. Those kind of people are kind of scratching their heads right now, I assume, and wondering... What do we do? Where do we go from here? What, who are we going to support? If we can't even support someone who's kind of a half-hearted libertarian like Rand Paul, what are we going to do? Yeah, I think that's right. So, yeah, Rand Paul, um, a perennial candidate, professional candidate, but the question is when. You know, we should just, yeah, find a blog and we'll put all of the GOP candidates and we'll just start betting as to when they're going to drop out. When they're going to go. Uh, Scott Walker Death was clock. a little surprise for me because I thought that, yeah, he crashed, but Oh, I, he gave up way I, too early. He did. I feel like if he had stayed in, he would be having this rise and not Marco Rubio. Yeah, Maybe. he's a palenti. Well, I mean, he's an idiot. Um, yeah. But he was like, he's a palenti of 2016, which is, why did you get out so early? But of course, I think it was, he was just too hard. It was too hard work to raise the money to keep his office open. And this is, I think, a fundamental flaw with the GOP establishment generally, if I can interject this before we move on, is that, you know, they spent the first part of 2015 courting donors. Mm-hmm. And what we've learned in the second half of 2015 is that donors aren't the ones who are going to be determining the outcome. They won't be. They'll determine so, who can stay in and for how long based on their, their donations. But the big difference between your state legislature race and your, your presidential primary race is that even, even like little Jim Gilmore, who's not even getting 0.1% of the vote, is going to get a little bit of media attention simply because he's got presidential candidate for the Republicans as his name placard. So they, the, um, but on the other hand, someone like Jeb Bush only has a hope now, that little hope we talked about earlier because of the fundraising he did. So yeah. it's a, uh, it's one of those things, uh, the donor class. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, so yeah, uh, Scott Walker got out too early was the Palenti of 2012, a uh, 2016 race. So I think yeah. that was, um, uh, and Rand Paul, yeah, done. So we can move on. Yeah. Uh, and I would put another couple people that are just kind of done that maybe don't need a bunch of explanation, Santorum and Huckabee. Yeah. Um, their niche is already being filled, and even if it wasn't, just like Ben Carson, they're no, they're going nowhere beyond Iowa. So there's no point in even, unless you have something really profound to change my mind. I feel like they're kind of two guys we can, just you know, we don't need to go too far. They're done. They yeah, I kind of. I, I feel like I've been at a party and I was talking to, to a group of people and then looked behind me and went, oh, Rick Santorum, you're still here. I thought you left the party like an hour and a half ago. <laughs> Rick? Rick yeah. would be that guy in the corner who's like, he doesn't know what to do with his hands. He doesn't want to drink any alcohol <laughs> and doesn't want to smoke. So he's just like. Do I put him in my pocket? Do I cross my arms? He's going to clean my glasses for three <laughs> minutes. Like. Or, no, he would adjust his sweater vest. That's what he would do. Yes. Well, I think we can also add to that list uh, Lindsey Graham, George Pataki. Yes. Lindsey Graham I'm going to miss a little bit because um, <laughs> not on any substantive reason, but just whenever he would be asked a question, it always astounded me and just entertained me when they'd say, Lindsey Graham, the new budget passed under John Boehner's house. What do you feel about the new budget? He said, well, let me tell you how I feel. This commander-in-chief is doing horrible on foreign policy. Terrorism, terrorism, Obama. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And like, well, Lindsay, if you want to attack Obama on foreign policy, man, you could probably do it in the foreign policy section of the debate. That's what it's there for, my friend. Uh, his, his ability to just like ignore the discussion and just jump straight to Libya. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> in terms of uh, his ability to stay on message, there are, you know, Ben Carson <laughs> could take some lessons from staying on message from Lindsey Graham. He could. And staying awake. At least Lindsey Graham looks like he drank a cup of coffee or something before he got That's started. True. That's true. <laughs> yeah. So does that really just leave Chris Christie as the last sort of yeah, potentially? Yeah, Christine Kasich. Christine Kasich. Oh, yes, Christine. Okay, the two C, the C and a K. 
Yeah, I, I'll be honest. As much as a political junkie as I am, I never have gotten it down whether it's Kasich or Kasich. So um, sometimes I just mix the two. <laughs> yes, I don't know. I've heard Kasich, but you're right. I've heard Kasich. So I think both accept in in this hangout, both mm. pronunciations are acceptable. Okay, so we're gonna just go ahead and lay that out. <laughs> uh, so I made a video before the last debate about Kasich being my dark horse candidate, and I'm still gonna let him be there because. I still think that the, the arguments apply. Um, and at the end, if you didn't watch my last video, you guys out there on the internet. Uh, I did see it, by the way. Yeah, uh, Christy was watching it, and, mm -hmm. I, and she disagreed with me on something in there, but I think we probably already covered that. Uh, but John Kasich, for me, if we, if we go ahead and say, like I said earlier, that the Republicans will probably come back to the establishment, or even if we say that there's a chance they'll come back to the establishment, like Christy does, but they might stay up at the top with the outsiders, um, that means that we have to look at those establishment people to say who is the most likely to come out on top. And if a donor wants to be smart, and if the Republicans want to be strategic, John Kasich is your guy. Because he has an okay record in Ohio, the unemployment rate was lower there, and in general, he isn't for slashing things like Social Security and Medicare, which will kill the Republicans in the general election. Why do I think that the Republicans would ever even take a second look at someone like that, who obviously is not Tea Party, He's not as conservative as someone like Ted Cruz. Why would they give him a second chance? And my, my argument now, I'm going to morph it a little bit and say that it's because as time goes on, as the election goes further, as we get past South Carolina, as we move on to Florida, Nevada, and Super Tuesday, electability will become a real issue. And with John McCain and Mitt Romney, one could make the argument both those guys were the Republican middle ground people trying to reel in the base at the last minute and say, whoa, 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 we're gone too far. Bring it back. Um, and so I'm just going to leave John Kasich out there as like my long shot, my hundred to one, like I'll put a buck on him. And if I win, I'll make a hundred dollars kind of guy. I think he's still got a sliver of a chance. I wish John, I mean, not, not okay. So I think John Kasich would have been better off running the last cycle mm -hmm. because he could have been the anti Romney. Yeah. He would have been a very, very good, incredible anti Romney in a race with a lot of other just clown car candidates who... Um, would have been a natural rival. It could have actually been a two-person race, essentially, I think, rather than a sort of nut bar up and down thing. Um, I think this year is just not his year. I don't think the base, it's, I don't think it's his base right now. Uh, the Iowa Republicans, I think, are a little more middle of the road, commercial, you know, sort of big business kind of Republicans than the evangelical, the deep things, and the Tea Party wing. He expanded um, Medicare in his state. Mm -hmm. which is a huge no-no with the Tea Party core. Mm -hmm. So I think the problem, I mean, I don't, I, I think that John Kasich is actually, if say when George, uh, George W. Bush, he would have been like a, such, so much a better president probably than, than W turned out to be. Yeah. I just feel like he's, he like Jeb is a man out of time. His party has left him behind. Except that Romney created an even bigger sin than expanding Medicare, and that was having his own version of Obamacare in his state. Yeah, so I, I agree. So sometimes, I mean, sometimes things can be crazy. That's why I leave him as a long shot. Yeah. I agree with you in, in general that, like, no, it's not going to happen. But <laughs> if we're looking at the establishment, guys, if Rubio falls to the arguments you mentioned earlier, if Bush continues to be the droopy dog and just falls out to the wayside at some point, if Chris Christie, who I'm assuming we're going to talk about soon, yeah. uh, you know, experiences some bump, which probably isn't likely, and then, you know, the scandals hog him and stuff. There's only so many establishment guys in the race, strangely enough. I mean, it's not going to be Pataki. It's going to have to be Kasich in that scenario. <laughs> All right. So, yeah. Um, so I guess we will see him as um, he's not leaving anytime soon. He's got to win in New Hampshire. He's got to at least place in New Hampshire. He's got to be like Huntsman. He's like Huntsman in 2012. Yeah. He's basically putting all his ships in New Hampshire and – We'll see. The, the, the dynamics of the race, as we've made, said a hundred times now, are just so different with 15 people in that it's hard to count anything out. It really is. Mm -hmm. Then we can talk about the fourth person whose destiny rests on New Hampshire. Mm -hmm. Chris Christie. Chris Christie, yep. Mm -hmm. I was reading an article today about Chris Christie, and it was this person, in a similar way we just talked about with Kasich, who was giving like, okay, if this happens and if this happens, then maybe Christie can jump in in New Hampshire. And the reason that game was gave was because, well, Christie is a liberal Republican and New Hampshire people like that. And I thought, 
it was a 538 blog. And I thought, I like 538, their statistics, but they should really stick to that and not define yeah. any words. Because Chris Christie, <laughs> it looks to me like the most typical Republican you could imagine. Cuts to education, cuts to pensions, budget uh, shortfalls and bad credit ratings for a state. And, 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 and on top of that, in New Jersey, you've got a, a, an ass load, for, for lack of a better term, of controversy and corruption, just like you know the stereotype. So what Chris Christie has going for him is that he's a good retail politician. And for that reason, he might pull off some sort of crazy New Hampshire comeback. But all the other things I just mentioned, especially the corruption in New Jersey, will come back to haunt him, which is why he's not my long shot candidate, John Kasich is, because that same thing will not happen to John Kasich, I think. <laughs> So maybe what we can do to wrap it up. Oh, I was just to say, Chris Christie. Yeah, I mean he's toast. I don't, I don't yeah. know why he's wasting his time, but I can really uh, agree. He's got a um, he has a role to play, but this year there are just too many actors trying out for that part. Yeah, good. Work. Well said. Well said. <laughs> so well, how about we do this every time we meet up? Let's let's give you because um, the ones that get the most attention are Iowa and New Hampshire. If you had to predict right now the top three in each of the first, in the first caucus and the first primary states. And how about we just, if we remember, we'll do this and see how much okay. it changes over the next, between now and February. Give me, and I'll do the same. So give me your top three in Iowa. Okay. And uh, your top three in New Hampshire. Who's going to finish in the top three spots? That's a tough one. Okay. Uh, Iowa, Cruz, number one, my prediction. Uh, Trump, number two. And... I'm going to say one of the establishment guys like Rubio is three. Okay. I'm going to stick with, uh, I guess you did it in order and that's, that's a fine. And I won't actually hold it to you. I'll just make the, the three. You don't have to put them in one, two, three. We'll just oh, say okay, the top okay. three. So you'll get your, you've got, you have Cruz, uh, Trump and who is your, Rubio. Rubio. okay. I'm going to go very similar. I'm actually going to think Carson is going to, um, well, I'm going to hold out that he's going to hold out a little bit of hope and I'll wait to see. So I'll okay. say um, Cruz, Carson and Trump. In Iowa. Okay. All right. Yeah. And yeah, now I'm regretting my Rubio guy. I, I, I would say some establishment guy will be three, but for now we'll just say Rubio. Yeah, you can change it the next time we have a hangout if you want to. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, no, no. I, uh, we'll see. Yeah. Um, okay, you can go first on New Hampshire. And then New Hampshire. All right. So I think in New Hampshire it's going to be Trump. And then in next, next is really hard. Well, actually, I don't have to put him in, in order. So I think Rubio. In New Hampshire, and who is the third? This is really, it's, New Hampshire is really easy because Trump is just dominating right now. Yeah. I don't think yeah. Carson is gonna last. Rubio has been making a break and I think he would be the darling of the sort of Northeast Republican types who might get behind him early. In terms of who's gonna come in, who's gonna come in third? Who's gonna come in third? It's not gonna be Jeb. It's not gonna be Cruz. I don't know. I'm going to have to give you, you have to think about this a little bit longer. Okay, so I'll jump in for number one. I'm going to make a bold prediction and say that John Kasich will win New Hampshire. <laughs> <laughs> that is a bold prediction. I, I don't know if that's going to happen, but hey, we'll see. Uh, and then Trump is number two. It'll probably, you're probably right. It'll probably be Trump, but got to keep things interesting here. And then as my number three, um, it's a tough one as well. Let's go with, I'm going to just make another bold prediction. Chris Christie will make a big surge. I'm, well, I'm so wrong. I'm so wrong. <laughs> You've actually, like, your enthusiasm for Kasich has influenced me. I'm going to say Trump, Rubio, Kasich for New Hampshire. Ah, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if, the, if the Republicans were smart, Kasich would be their guy. A, a yeah. reasonable guy from a swing state, he could pick Rubio as his vice president from another swing state. He'd be golden, but, you know, it, like we said, it's not probably going to happen. <laughs> no, yeah. That's not our electorate. We don't understand those people. As well. Well, we try through cross tabs and other statistics. So. <laughs> All right. So I think we went a little over on time. It's about uh, an hour and 45 minutes, but um, that's all. <laughs> <laughs> Instead of an hour and uh, 30. But um, if you won't mind sticking around, I want to talk to you on the other side after we go live. But um, for everybody who enjoyed this chat, um, go and check out Fox Cousins on YouTube. Go sub them. Go sub Will. He's fantastic. And uh, yeah, I think if, this has really gone well. So I'm sure that we can find a time to do this. And plus, we're both political junkies, so we don't get to talk to people, at least not yeah. willingly, usually. Like, our friends will sit there and kind of put up with our political talk, but mm -hmm. this is it's just, true. yeah, <laughs> great. Oh, and one more thing. Let me just add yeah. that for anyone, um, if you are one of my subscribers and you make it this far in the video, first of all, 
Thank you. Congratulations. You're awesome. You have lots of patience. But two, um, if you are watching this from my channel, you should go check out Christy Winners as well. Christy, is your URL just Christy Winners? Um, yeah, well, if you just put it in the search bar. Okay. It comes Christy, up. With a, Christy with an I. Um, and, and a K. Yeah, thank you so much. It's been a lot of fun. Yeah, great. All right, so everyone else, we're going to say goodbye to you, and then we're going to chat a little bit off air, um, and you can't watch, sorry. All right, so um, until the next time that we see each other, I've been Christy, and you've been awesome. Thanks for watching all the way to the end of the video, and I'll talk to you guys soon. Bye.